our second video of the distance learning playbook study where we are going to share with you some highlights from our topics we covered in September and give you a preview of what to expect in October. But before we begin, we wanted to take just a second and thank you all that were able to join us for the live session with Doug Fisher, um, as well as thank you for your patience as we work through some technical issues. But we know that on the other side of getting through those technical issues, it was a phenomenal session with Doug Fisher, and we hope that you took away a lot of inspiration and just some ideas um, from that session. If you are not able to attend that live session, please know that the recorded version of it is available in the Google Classroom under General Resources in the Classwork tab. But for today's video, during the month of September, we have been learning about self-care as well as creating and managing distance learning classrooms. So for the video, the two success criteria we have is that one, you can make connections from what you read or what you even heard in that session with Dr. Fisher to our provided highlights from the first month's topics. And then the second success criterion is that you can explain the expectations for completing the second month's assignments in Google Classroom. So when we start with um, some highlights from the introduction, we want to go back to something that Doug Fisher also mentioned in his video, and that is really making sure we un understand the difference between what happened this past spring and what is currently happening now this fall. This past spring was truly crisis teaching. We went into that under an emergency situation in a very short amount of time with little time to prepare for what that was going to look like. But this fall, we all are in a distance learning setting. This is truly distance learning where we need to focus on applying those main elements of teaching and learning that we know can improve student achievement to the distance learning setting. So one of the things the authors talked about in the introduction were five elements that we know can really impact student achievement, and we have to think about how do we apply those to distance learning. So they specifically mentioned fostering student self-regulation putting teacher students in the role of being able to control their learning, not just having the teacher to control that. And that as teachers, we need to use a variety of instructional approaches so that we're not falling back into the trap of just that traditional mode of teaching with direct instruction and with students working independently. We need a variety of approaches even in the distance learning setting. And a part of that is we know that learning is social. So the fourth bullet is really talking about making sure in our distance learning setting, we are designing peer learning opportunities for them to interact and collaborate around the content. And then finally, it's critically important that we include feedback as part of the learning cycle, and that includes teacher to student feedback, peer feedback, as well as student self assessment. So the things that we know work really well in the face to face setting, we know we have to find ways to apply though in the distance learning setting as well. And how do we know that these things work? Well, a lot of it is coming from John Hattie's research that he did his meta analysis that is in the visible learning text. And in the um, text that we are reading and in the session with Doug Fisher, they talk a lot about what is effect size. So they tell us that effect size basically informs us of how powerful something is in creating change or accelerating student learning. And through the research, we know that anything that has an effect size of greater than 0.4 can really improve students' growth. It can help us to really accelerate student learning beyond just one year's growth and one year's time. And we know that in order to get that effect, we have to use those elements intentionally and purposefully in our classroom setting. And if you look at a lot of other educational experts, you're going to see these same things play out. They're going to highlight the same element. So really what this text is all about is how do we apply what we know to be good in teaching and learning that impacts student achievement into that distance learning setting. So those are some of the highlights from the introduction. And now let's move into that next module. So just like our students, we know the impact that stress can have on both our minds and our bodies. However, just add to that stress the new challenges that have emerged from the pandemic and from distance learning, and we quickly realize that it's more important than ever for us to take care of ourselves. 
when we're burnt out, we become tired and overwhelmed, as you know. It becomes very difficult to manage taking care of the needs of others, like our family and our students, when we aren't making sure that we're taking care of our own needs. And so Ricky Robertson really paints the perfect picture for us with this analogy that we often hear from flight attendants, which is making sure we put on our own oxygen mask before helping others. And so let's take a look at some of the recommendations for the text for maintaining that healthy balance. The text really talked about bracketing our workday by having both a morning and an end of day routine to signal to our brains that our day workday has concluded. And this could be something as simple as grabbing a cup of coffee or getting a drink from the teacher's lounge. Um, something that really signals to your brain that your day is over. Um, we want to make sure that we consistently create those structures and routines to really signal that for us. So whatever that is for you, it's equally important not only to bracket our day, but also making sure that we're scheduling those regular breaks um, and ensuring that we're not burning ourselves out by working well beyond our typical work day. Not taking that time to recharge our batteries really takes a toll on us eventually and typically results in more stress and more burnout. So we know as educators, there's always more work to do, to do right? However, I personally have found that I'm a lot more productive in my regular workday when I take short breaks, maybe take a quick walk to the mailbox or a quick walk to grab a drink um, throughout the day. And also ensuring that I'm ending my day as close as possible to my normal work time or ending time. So in order to maintain that balance at home then, and I know some of you are continuing to teach from home after September 28th, we know our stress levels are reduced when we have clear guidelines for the people around us. So it's important we take the time to communicate those expectations to the family and friends who are in our workspace to maintain those healthy boundaries. We've heard other educators share an interesting perspective on social distancing. Rather than using the term social distancing, we should consider referring to it as physical distancing while maintaining social closeness, as we don't want to send the message that we are distancing ourselves socially from one another. We know the text really talks about how important it is to remain, maintain those social connections and have time to socialize every day. One of the strategies the book talked about was maybe even making sure that you're taking time every day to talk to someone outside of your household. And so this slide really shares some suggestions from the United Nations on ways in which you can keep a social connection, such as exercising, taking a walk outside, unplugging from your devices or singing. And so those were just some of the main highlights from module one. Now let's let's look a little bit at module two. Two was all about the first days of school. Now, when we began the study, we know that many of you had already gone through your first days of school, but as some of you are now transitioning back to the face-to-face -face setting, you may feel like you're back in those first days again. But some of the things that the text talked about, it equally applies to face-to-face -to -face setting as well. And one of the things it talked about is the importance of establishing norms and routines for our students, because at the end of the day, if we don't do that, norms are going to evolve in our classrooms for better or worse, one way or another. So the more clear we are in those expectations and establishing those norms, the more successful students are going to be, regardless of the setting. And so some tips that the book shared around uh, establishing those norms in classroom agreements. They talked about how less is more, that ideally we want to have three to five norms in classroom agreements, and that we want to co-construct those with our students. When students are a part of the process of uh, creating those norms in classroom agreements, they have more buy-in and are more willing to follow and honor those norms and agreements. We want to make sure that we state them positively and that they're specific in nature. We want to avoid any kind of vague norm or agreement where students aren't clear as to the meaning. The more specific we can be, the more likely students are to uphold those expectations. 
And then we want to ensure that we post the agreements. And so many of us already do this in the face to face setting. It's just thinking about how do we post those in the distance learning setting? So that might include any time you come into a synchronous meeting, you may start that meeting with a reminder of the classroom norms and agreements where you may post those in the chat. In your LMS, whatever that LMS may be, it could be that you have those linked in that as well for the students. And then finally, and probably most importantly, it's about teaching and practicing those expectations with your students so that they clearly understand what an expectation or a norm looks like and sounds like in the distance learning setting. And even as we come back for some of you all face to face, you may want to start considering what are the norms that I have for my students and expectations that apply to the face to face setting and the distance learning setting? So what are some of those that cross over to both? And then you may want to think about what are the ones that are unique to the face to face setting and what are the ones unique to the distance learning setting? Because the reality of the current times that we are in is that even though you may be returning face to face now at any point, you may have to go back to distance learning. So it's thinking about how do we help our students seamlessly transition between face to face and distance learning and being critically or clear on what those classroom norms and agreements are. In terms of distance learning, the text specifically talked about it's important to identify and teach what your expectations are for the synchronous learning. So the times when you're meeting live together with your students and they said it's helpful to think about um, explaining those expectations in terms of getting ready for the class meeting during the class meeting and then at the close of the class meeting. So thinking through what are those expectations? How will I teach them those expectations so that we get the most out of every live session we can? The text also gave an example of how it's a good idea to pair what your norms and agreements are in writing alongside of a picture to better illustrate the true meaning. So that's helpful to our primary students, but also to some of our other po populations of students like our EL students. It better shows exactly what that expectation is by pairing the words with the picture. And again, you had different examples throughout the text of what those expectations might be. The last thing it talked about in module two was the importance of really getting to know your students in those first days. Now, later we're going to be looking at student and teacher relationships and how important they are, but it does begin with getting to know your students' names and what their interests are. And so just like in the face to face setting, every day you probably would stand outside your door and greet every kid by name as they come in. We need to do that same thing as well in the distance learning setting. As students join your synchronous sessions, you need to greet them by name so that they feel seen as they join that meeting. Um, we this month put out a Padlet uh, wall where you all could add ideas of how you are getting to know your students and their interests. And there are some amazing ideas included in that Padlet. So we have posted that now under the resources for the month of September. And the great thing about those ideas, you can use them throughout the entire school year, not just at the beginning. So if you're looking for another way that you can keep getting to know your students, we recommend you going to that Padlet wall and seeing what colleagues around the state are doing to help with that. So that wraps up some of the highlights we wanted to pull out from our uh, topics we covered in September. Now let's look ahead to October. OK, so going back to our success criteria for today, we wanted to briefly explain the expectations for completing the second month's topic in Google Classroom. So as stated in our overview video, your study plan plan found in Google Classroom, that's your continual go to throughout the study. Most of the links for the synchronous meetings um, as well as your reflect and respond questions are all going to be listed here in that study plan. So in the month of October, we're really focused on creating those strong teacher student relationships, establishing and maintaining credibility, as well as increasing clarity through our learning intentions and success criteria in the distance learning setting. You can see we have those success criteria really broken down for you by module. You'll also note in that fourth column there for reflect and respond, it says choose two of the four. So we've provided four activities there for you to choose two of. 
um, to respond to. And so you will respond to those either in a Flipgrid or in a Google Docs. And I'll show you that in just a moment. But you will not have to do all of those and you won't have to do both Flipgrid and Google Docs. You will choose one of those. And then finally in that last column, we have some extension activities listed there. So um, within there, you'll see an excerpt from Corwin that talks about using trust to build student teacher relationships. There's also an Edutopia article there about the seven ways to maintain relationships during uh, school closure, as well as a Fisher and Fry article there about boosting teacher credibility. There's also, um, in thinking about the learning intentions and su success criteria, there's a great video there by Larry Ainsworth that talks about why clarity matters. And so that might be one that you'll want to check out. So again, fun. these are optional. Hopefully they will help to build your background. Um, but we've tried to be mindful of the different roles of people we have participating in the study. So hopefully everyone will find something there that they will find valuable and helpful. And again, your study plan can be found linked under the classwork tab under general resources. Just as a reminder, we have included places for you to respond to your reflect and respond activities, just like I mentioned before, via Google Docs or Flipgrid. Um, we have noticed that a couple people have done both. You don't need to do both, just choose one, whichever one you feel more comfortable with and use that as your platform to respond. And here's where you will go to tell us which October meeting you are planning to attend. So which of those synchronous meetings is going to best suit your schedule? This is just going to help us in managing those numbers for our breakout room discussions. So if you've not done so already, please take a minute to go into Google Classroom to make that choice. And this is what that form looks like. You'll either select Monday, October 12th at 4.30 p.m. or Thursday, October 15th at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we provided two different time frames because we know some people are in that central time zone, so we wanted to accommodate as many people as possible. So choose the date and time that best suits your schedule. And then finally, if you have any questions moving forward, please don't hesitate to reach out to either of us uh, with questions. Misty and I are happy to help. And we know we have several people who have just joined the study, which is very exciting, and who may need clarification on where things are or how to turn in assignments. We're happy to answer those questions for you. Just feel free to email us here. And thank you for watching. We hope that you found the first month of our fall book study beneficial.